I hope that you had a nice time at the networking event yesterday and that you learned a lot about the maritime history of Bilbao. Um, I also noticed that many of you learned for the first time how to dance. And um, it was, for me, really, it was an inspiration. I'm going to be dancing a lot more now. Um, I'd like to just remind you of a few little things. We have our interpretation. You will need headphones, both for the questions and for the panel session later. So make sure you have your headphones with you. We are still web streaming, so welcome to our international audience. We haven't looked, uh, I haven't looked yet at the analytics, but I do know that there were people watching from Canada. There were people watching from Bangkok. And uh, there was someone watching from Jakarta, but as you all know, that's my sister. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really interested when we find the, um, when we get the analytics at the end to see what countries joined us. So welcome to our international audience as well. We have the Twitter handle. If you're a Twitter, the handle is hashtag EU OSHA Summit. And we will, during the course of the session this morning be using Slido. So please take out your phones, log on to Slido, put your phone on silent, but uh, here you have the name, you have the password, and later on you can ask questions, um, which you know, might be interesting for you. I was going to put you through another Slido question, but I decided to spare you. But we will have more Slido questions at the end of today, when we have a 60 second Slido showdown. So, now we move on. All of you yesterday, after the opening session, went into the parallel workshops. I believe some of you had a little Slido moment where it didn't work because of an internet connection. Despite my training, what can you do? But uh, mm, I hope you enjoyed the workshops and that they were stimulating. Certainly from the feedback I got last night, the workshops were very interesting. So now I'm really looking forward to hearing about them. And to remind you, use Slido to ask a question because we'll be taking questions at the end. And also um, we'll, we'll ask each, we'll, we won't take the questions after each report back from the workshop. We'll take them all at the end. So. First up, I would like to ask our very own Elke Schneider to come and tell us what exciting things happened in session one, carcinogens at work. Thank you, Elke. Thank you. So I hope everybody had a nice and enjoyable evening, evening and is fresh now for the reports from the, from the sessions. I'll start with the carcinogens at work. The, the aim of this session was to focus on successful prevention practices to minimize carcinogen use and exposure. So we had three interventions uh, regarding exposures in the service sectors and occupations. Um, one, one related to uh, public services, one related to the hospital environment, and one related to welding fumes. So all substances and chemicals that are not uh, covered by the chemicals, not necessarily covered by the chemicals legislation, and I'll give some details. Uh, and we also looked at what the success factors of these, these initiatives were and then had a discussion on what is needed at workplaces to make prevention work regarding carcinogens at work. 
The participants in our session, we asked them where they came from, and most of them were from government and ministries. We had a few people from labor inspectors, uh, but also employers and workers' representatives. The first example concentrated on substitution of hazardous disinfectants in public services. And it's an example from the municipality of Vienna that has set up a uh, public procurement policy that sets out to avoid um, substances that are dangerous to the environment and dangerous to human health, with the aim to select disinfection products while paying attention to both occupational safety and health and environmental protection. They developed a database for disinfectants, which, which is called VIDES, and is available in German and English. And uh, there are also some videos available to explain the database and the use of the database. So what, how, how is it used in the city of Vienna? It's used for advice to hospitals, to nursery schools, to schools, swimming pools, and other facilities everywhere where disinfectants are used and that's quite a lot of different workplaces. The substitutes that are recommended in the database are certified by independent institutions and there are regular updates financed by, by the city of Vienna and by other Austrian institutions. Uh, we, we discussed uh, the success factors, we discussed how difficult it was to set up this database and actually at the beginning there, were quite, there was quite some resistance from the, from the producers of such products, but in the end now they are applying to be included in the database, so certainly a very successful example. There were also considerable savings through the, the use of this concept and uh, it has received recommendations from several organizations. So after so just to illustrate how, how difficult it is to do substitution and to choose the right product, uh, this is a scheme that shows different products and compares the different toxic, toxic uh, properties of these products. So it means that the, the database is not prescriptive, but for every use, uh, the, the user has to look at the, the most important properties and what is most relevant for their use at their workplace. We got some reactions. We asked for some reactions from the audience through Slido, and we asked whether there were similar initiatives, and actually we got a no from about 60% of, of the audience. So it's really worthwhile having these examples presented here and sharing these experiences. The next example was from Spain, and again, it was a practical web tool that was provided. <coughs> Sorry. And that provided information on hazardous drugs um, to um, workers in the healthcare sector. So for whom was this meant? To protect whom? Pharmacy workers, nurses, physicians and physicians' assistants, healthcare, auxiliary nurses, veterinary, but also veterinary workers or cleaning workers, laundry workers and so on. So quite a, a diverse a group of different workers. Um, the, the, the tool contains all pharmaceutical specialties that are marketed in Spain and included in the medicinal products database based on recommendations from NIOSH and other bodies. The name of the medicinal product is included in the database and also the Galenic form, so the administration form of the medicine. And the database includes general preventive recommendations that follow the hierarchy of control measures. The tool, however, is not a workplace risk assessment. It's a first uh, tool to, to identify drugs and, and the risks uh, from these drugs, and then there has to be a risk assessment in the different institutions, hospitals, and so on. Why is this important? Because for many of these, the CLP regulation does not apply. So we will not have safety data sheets or label on these, on these products. And uh, they, they are subject to the medicinal products directive. And information is normally in a package leaflet or in a data sheet. So information is a little bit less accessible than through the safety data sheets for other, other manufacturers products. We asked after that, again, we had a Slido question to the, uh, to the audience, and we asked the audience whether their country foresees any specific regulations or guidance, and whether this was going beyond the group of cytostatic drugs. 
and uh, we got some feedback, but still in some there is not there is no, not a tool available. So again, the, the, it illustrates why it's important to share such, such experiences. We had some quite lively discussions there. We had the Spanish Nurses Union who made a point pointing out that there were still workplaces where, where there were issues like home care or, for example, elderly homes. The third presentation was on guidance by the Senior Labour Inspectors Committee's Chemex group, and this is the second guidance that has been produced by this group. It's guidance for national labor inspectors for addressing health risks, and this time it concentrates on welding fume. Why welding fume? There are quite a, quite a number of welders across the EU which work in different uh, jobs, maintenance, construction, but also other, other sectors and quite wi wi widespread across the member states. There's high potential for exposure to hazardous substances, but there's also a range of general hazards like electric shock or eye injuries, for example. Um, there are respiratory effects and other health effects, for example, neurological or autotoxic or reprotoxic effects. So quite a range of health effects. This guidance as I said, is intended for labor inspectors. It has a general part which explains the health effects, the legal framework, how to carry out exposure assessment and so on, and also some practical task sheets that concentrate on different techniques for welding and explain what the measures should be and give some guidance for labor inspectors to recognize some of the risks and uh, maybe even stop work at a cert certain workplace if the risk excess, uh, exceeds a certain level. And there's also a task sheet that addresses the general hazards that I just mentioned, like electric shock uh, issues related to confined spaces, noise, and so on. After this presentation, we also asked the audience uh, whether this guidance, whether they felt this guidance was useful. And they, they, they agreed. 70% of our audience agreed that this was very useful, and some said that it was partly useful. So again, there's an argument for sharing this experience in this session. After that, we had a discussion where we address different questions. What can be done to avoid the use of carcinogens and improve prevention? How can awareness be improved? What support to give to different actors? And how the examples can contribute to better prevention? We had interventions from members of the working party of the advisory committees, working party on chemicals, who reacted to the presentations from the speakers. We had a general discussion on the use of guidance and the links to legislation. Uh, everybody agreed on the importance of worker involvement and information for workers sharing information on these risks at these specific workplaces, and that it was important to share such good practices. And that's what we are doing here at the agency, sharing, trying to, to bring these, uh, these good practices out and sharing them. We had uh, some mention of other examples. For example, Finland is including cytostatic drugs and exposure to welding fumes related to certain techniques into the national carcinogens regulation. They also mentioned their ASA register of exposure to carcinogens, which includes compulsory uh, reports from companies and will be improved and, and uh, digitalized so that, that uh, there's better search function and information can be better extracted. And we also had a mention of, a Germ of Germany, where, which sets up a technical rule for dangerous substances related to welding fumes. So again, a few good practices to share. At the end of our, of our session, we asked what is most needed at the workplace level regarding carcinogens, and everybody agreed that it was awareness raising and training and information, especially for workers. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank my colleague Alberto Sokol, who's helped me with the Slido questions and with managing these sessions, and also the speakers at the workshop and those who participated. Unfortunately, we had little discussion time, but we did extend the, the length of the session to have a little bit of discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Elke. And now, from parallel session two, we're going to have a report on the exciting things that happened in there from our very own Tim Tregenza, who's going to tell us about good practices. If I can find my presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. In our session, we were looking about interventions into the workplace and to try and identify success factors and uh, approaches that can be transferable and, and used across Europe, particularly on how can knowledge on dangerous substances be transferred to promote the behavior change we need in workplaces to improve prevention. And we looked at three um, areas. One is inspection, visual inspection. The second was the substitution process and the third was how we communicate with workers. Um, our first speaker, Victor, from um, Dublin, uh, the Technological University of Dublin is carrying out ongoing research on this and it's quite simply if we're not careful, when we're doing visual inspections of the workplace, we may be looking but we aren't seeing. And this, um, so when we, you know, as an inspector, you go in, you are looking for hazards as your, one of your first starting points as part of your inspection process. And we can see that this process can be improved by employing systematic visual search. That means constructing a search process where you, you focus on specific areas within the room you're looking at. And what was very important that we have to be honest about this process, recognizing that we will miss hazards and we have to be uh, clear when we report back on our inspections. Raluca um, reported on the process of substitution, which is this key element in the prevention hierarchy and we, we identified there are many drivers for substitution, legal, yes, but also substitution can provide a competitive advantage, it can create a good company image, and the company is adapting to technical process. However, we have to recognize that substitution is a journey. It's not you take A and you in, insert it into B and you get your result. It's not, um, it can be a long-term process and you may not be certain of the outcome. So this is why any support, intervention support we make to workplaces undergoing substitution, there has to be ongoing support, perhaps through network-based approaches, to ensure the process is successful. And then Emilia was telling us about, in Portugal, how they're communicating to workers. And I, we, we, I summarized it here by providing the right information in the right format, in the right language, at the, by the right people at the right time, and more than once, because information and training has to be uh, repeated. It's not a one-off process. And that, in particular, multimedia approaches can be very effective. We saw examples of uh, videos and information sessions uh, that have been used. We have to recognize that um, such interventions on information and training alone, that's not sufficient. There also has to be the supporting organizational measures, the collective control measures, and systems of work. And finally, you, know, you have to adapt the material to the specific workplace. If you go with generic materials, you may not gain the attention, you may not be successful in your communication. In our discussion, um, we had an interesting discussion about making clear the benefits of carrying out a structured visual inspection. And one of the issues here is it's an effective use of time. You know, everybody's busy. Everybody has limited time to be doing their interventions. So by, be, by being structured in our approach, we maximize that time. We then had an interesting discussion about data sheets. And these contain masses of information but they're not always ideal for communicating to workplaces. And it is often the case you may start with your data sheet to get the basic information, and that has to be adapted for the specific task or substance or work process or workplace. 
And, and finally, we discuss checklists. And checklists can provide a very good structure to interventions, to inspections. But checklists alone are not sufficient, because if you end up with a checklist that's complete, you have the world's biggest checklist. A checklist will always be a framework and not a, a, a complete solution, but they can be very useful when making interventions. That was a very brief summary of a long and interesting discussion we have in our unit. So please, if you want to know more, please start asking in Slido. Thank you very much. And session three was on sustainable management and substitution of dangerous substances in production processes. Regina. If I find my presentation. So here we go. Can you please make this work? It has all the technical problems during this conference. Okay, ready to go. Finally. Okay, and it comes up. Very good. So, um, <laughs> yeah, as I just said, I think session three had booked um, the technical problems for this session because yesterday we had actually to change the beamer before we could get started. Um, and today, yeah, it, it didn't take that long. So, okay, but what we were talking about yesterday was about um, substitution of dangerous substances um, related to production processes. So the objective of the workshop was actually to share information on, on what different companies have done, what they have implemented. Um, and there were, there were three different projects presented. 
One was really um, related to a change in a production process, a substitution of a, a glue used in brake pad uh, production. Um, and the second one was an example on how you can work together in making your product less hazardous, meaning identifying hazardous substances before they go into the product, actually. Um, and, and the third example from a company was about um, how can you effectively manage your chemicals that are being used in your company. So um, we saw a very interesting database. And I will talk through each of the processes. Uh, of the project. And, and then we, we got also um, Marian and she was, she was giving us a good input on how the workers see chemicals management and, and their risk and what the expectations from, from the worker side is to prevent people from harm. So that was the first one um, about brake pet production. So um, there, is, there is a glue needed to fix this, this little brake pad on a metal plate. And this is a very tricky process because this is safety related, um, which means product safety. Because if the brake pad comes off, your brake's gone. So it's, a, it's very important. And therefore, it was, was really not very easy to find a solution. But finally, um, engineering find, found really a great solution because um, the, the whole process was, was really quite nasty, I have to say. Um, we had used a, a liquid glue with a lot of hazardous characteristics. All the handling was, um, was really not state of the art. So there was a lot of handling, cleaning activities, um, using other chemicals, which was causing additional exposure. A lot of waste was created, air emissions, so that, that was something where we knew we got to change this and we cannot do this forever. Um, and as I said, that was quite a challenge because we, we needed to balance um, product safety because, as I mentioned, the, the brake pad must work at any time. Um, we had to address health, safety and environmental aspects. And also we had to look at cost, of course. So, and, and the solution was actually, um, was actually quite a great solution because we were able to replace this um, sticky, liquid, dangerous glue with a, with a glue powder, with a powder glue, which really helped us to significantly reduce the exposure to chemicals, to hazardous chemicals. The process itself is, is much cleaner, much easier in handling. We could eliminate um, 150 tons of solvents annually, and also 20, we could reduce our hazardous waste to 20 tons every year. Um, and, and actually, um, also, we are, we are reusing the powder glue in the process. So um, the, the efficiency of the use of materials is also much, much better. Maintenance is easier, cleaning is easier. So overall, um, from this perspective, really um, very successful. And, and the very nice thing here is as well that we could reduce the cost for production, um, which is also for a company an, an important factor. So um, whenever you want to start something and you start chasing your guys, they should change the process. Let them know that uh, there's always a business case. If you do something for health, safety, environment, you, you get a good payback usually, right? And, and this project was a six-digit saving every year. So the second project um, that has been presented was about um, how in automotive industry the, the supply chain works and collaborates to make sure that um, there are no hazardous substances or that or just in a very reduced way hazardous substances in in the in the final product, which is the car, which is um, also very difficult because um, a car has a lot of component 
um, about 30,000 parts go into a car. So you can imagine there are many, many suppliers involved. So you, you need to have a, a real good system to get um, information about, um, about everything that goes into your car to later on make sure that your car doesn't contain any substance that it shouldn't. Because there are also a lot of restrictions. Uh, the end of life vehicle directive gives you a, a long catalogue of substances that cannot be in the car. So, um, what has been developed in the automotive industries quite some while ago, so that's back to actually 2000, so all the, the um, automotive companies worked together and set up a database, the, uh, which is called IMDS, so everybody in the automotive sector knows this, the International um, Material Substance Database. and. Um, so everybody has to report into this database. Any supplier needs to put information into this database. You see that on the right side, from the raw material, the content of the raw material, then the content of, of any component, um, the, the final part that goes into the car, and finally you have all information for the car in that database. And the car producer can look this up. And they are also in the design and development process, this is being always double-checked against the, the applicable regulations and against the applicable substance restrictions. So with this you can make sure that you get a more or less green car. Right, and there are no substances in it that you that you don't want to, and and you have then also in the design process you have a chance to look at it and and make adjustments and reduce hazardous substances. There was from the group um, there was there was a uh, concern about um, production that happens outside the EU. Um, and, and we had actually a discussion on this because sometimes, of course, we, we, have, um, we have suppliers outside the European Union and emerging countries and they might have uh, other applicable leg uh, legislation and standards. But I think, yeah, it's, um, it is important to look at this and we got to start here looking at this and making sure that uh, also outside the EU, when we qualify suppliers, that they comply with the standards. I mean, any piece that goes into this system must comply, but the other thing is, how has this been produced, right? And, and that's something that definitely needs to be addressed and um, needs to be looked at in, in the future. Um, there was also a question on um, what, does, what does really drive change here or did drive the, the change here. Um, actually, I think in both cases we could say that the initial thing was um, legislation uh, for this database. It was the end of life vehicle directive where the, uh, the car producers have to make sure they comply with um, with all these substance restrictions, and they have to um, they have to ensure recyclability of the cars, um, and and then how do you manage this? So and then this this came up. Nowadays, it's actually um, also helping, I think, um, to promote green cars because uh, from the consumer, there's more and more the wish to to get a, a green car, and and to know what what is in the car, and there's nothing harmful in. And, and the other case was actually um, the, the starting point was the VOC directive. Um, the VOC emissions um, were, were the initial of the project and, and then later on, um, as, we, as we identified, there were so many other benefits. I mean, the, the program actually speeded up here. Um, that was about how you manage, how you really manage hazardous substances, and especially in um, in a in an organisation with different locations, different languages, um, and and um, yeah, I like this, this quite much because um, they used a database, which was which was very easy to understand. 
and um, and with his database, um, the database is available in in different languages, so there's easy access, and you can you can add any feature. Um, you can do risk assessments. You can have your inventory. Uh, so I found this uh, quite a quite a good tool. And if you Google it, you find it also on the web and can can see uh, can look at the feature. And and finally, as I said, we had um, Marian giving us um, a an insight from what what the workers um, what the workers' expectation are in terms of managing hazardous substances. So one thing that has been widely discussed was the hierarchy of control, which means substitution, go for substitution, and make sure actually if you do substitution substitution, that it's a real substitution and you do not, um, you do not in, uh, introduce a new risk or, or additional risks, but that it's really a less harmful substance. And, and also, if, if we are not sure, we also need to always follow the precautionary principle. So, and, and we had discussions on how to get the, the end user or the worker involved into the, into the process, which is, which is, I think, very important because those are the guys handling the substances. And, um, and also we discussed how could we better um, promote and share best practices. Um, because if there are good solutions from one company, so that should be really widely shared. And, and, um, there was also a discussion on what does that mean, zero accidents. We always talk about accidents, but I think we also need to look about the diseases that, that work may cause and, and also develop similar strategies to, uh, to avoid diseases, right? So, and yeah, that was in brief what we had discussed yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mindful of time, mindful of time. We're going to move straight on now to my colleague, Lothar Leek, uh, who's going to tell us about what happened in the fourth parallel session on main challenges for effective prevention. And we have some questions coming in on Slido. If you have a question, write it down. And we'll, we'll take one or two at the end. We're running slightly over, but it's okay. Off you go, Lothar. No, oh, it works. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm reporting uh, shortly about what happened in uh, workshop number four. The title was Main Challenges for Effective Prevention. So uh, it was a little bit more on an abstract level than these uh, beautiful examples that we heard now. We had, uh, in, in fact, uh, five speakers, so three with presentations and uh, and. Uh, uh, one from uh, the Agricultural Trade Union and uh, one speaker from Business Europe. So the aim was simply to identify uh, w what are the major uh, problems, which data do we have, um, which changes are expected in, let's say, the next 10, 15 years, and um, what is uh, currently done in industry that's using uh, chemical substances, that's generating uh, dangerous uh, substances in its processes. Um, so how is the change going on so that we can better prepare for future prevention? Um, the first one was um, Ioannis Bassinas from Institute of Occupational Medicine. The IOM did a lot of uh, studies on, on, on substances for certain uh, commission uh, directorates to, to prepare uh, legislation uh, from a scientific view. And uh, this was a report how to monitor how many workers at which workplaces are at which levels exposed to which substances. And, um, uh, IOM proposed in collaboration uh, with, with EU OSHA a, a simple method to use public data so that a permanent surveillance is not always a big research task and study. So um, this is possible, of course, there is a, a, a large range of uncertainty, but um, the system to combine different databases seems to, uh, seems to work. Uh, the second speaker was Fisil Mushtak from, from ECA, 
uh, talking about the impact of regulatory actions on substance registrations under REACH. Um, as I said, my first uh, idea of this workshop was to say, where are we now, where are we in 10 years, and what should we do to make it better in 10 years than we did it now, and better than it, as it was in the past. And REACH is, of course, a major instrument. Um, if you if you look at the first uh, speaker, so how many workers are exposed, what you don't find under REACH, of course, is the number of people exposed to certain substances. But still, of course, REACH is a, a huge instrument to reduce, to restrict to certain uses, to uh, authorize uh, certain substances. Most of you are more or less uh, familiar with uh, with uh, reach and its uh, impact on industry. So, um, as, you, as you see here, most hazardous substances are subject to, to regulation. For, the, for many other substances, data are still needed, but there are other tools to, to uh, let's say, to make the users less uh, hazardous. And in future, of course, mm, here at this um, event, we like that very much. There should be a better collaboration or a good collaboration between REACH and OSH to, um, let's say, to identify the best methods to pro make progress. The third one was uh, uh, Stefan Engel on behalf of the, the, the German Association of the Chemical Industry. He himself is working uh, as uh, Director of Industrial Hygiene for, for BASF. And uh, he showed us um, so so the, the, the approaches that the industry currently does, so individual workplace risk assessment, even doing the same thing at a, diff a little bit different workplaces can change the risk uh, uh, dramatically. Then, we, then he explained the, the, the reduction of the OELs and the methods of industry to cope with that. And uh, his, one of his major final statements was that it becomes more and more difficult to achieve uh, to achieve these low levels of OELs that have been um, regulated in the last <clears throat> in the last years, um, the presentations are of course uh, available. I can't go so very deep into this. Uh, the, the contribution from Arndt Bahn was more on this on the agricultural side. So, 40 million farmers, 70 million uh, farms. Uh, Diseases undocumented, working conditions undocumented, what they use, how often they use that, at which places. So uh, a, a sector which is, of course, a complete difference to a well-organized big company. Uh, and, and so the prevention approaches uh, have to be uh, different, of course. So the implementation of any regulation is much more difficult in such a sector, uh, be, beside uh, many, many other issues. And uh, Chris de Meester uh, mainly highlighted that uh, what, what industry needs is good practice, uh, good practice transfer, and not so, let's say, so, so uh, difficult to implement occupational exposure limits, which are more theory than reality, which, which company is really measuring them, and uh, this was his main statement. Um, the conclusions, my last uh, slide here, is uh, it's possible to get currently better data on exposure and worker exposure. From ECHA, th there's an impact of reach, of course, on the structure of the used sub substances, the quantity. Still, the assessment needs more certainty in, in many, many, uh, for many substances. Um, the chemical industry, many efforts, but coming close to the limit to cope with new and stricter uh, OELs. Agriculture, undocumented use of pesticides and its consequences. Business Europe, good practice, most relevant. My conclusion, my personal conclusion is, it seems that we need still more data which substances are used, which, under which working conditions, which diseases are produced by the use of this substance or, or not, because due to good prevention. More good practice, more transfer of good practice, 
uh, more discuss discussions about the feasibility of certain regulations and um, finally more connection that was also uh, from Business Europe of the different regulatory areas. So the same thing that Faisal Mushtaq from ECA said about better collaboration between the occupational health area and REACH. So that was my uh, report. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lothar. Thank you very much, Lothar. We've had, we'll take a couple of minutes for a few questions. They've been coming in now um, quite quickly. Um, we had one question from somebody saying a request. Could we run a 10-year campaign on risk assessment? And uh, I'll take that question. Uh, we already did have a campaign on risk assessment, but I suppose risk assessment is so fundamental to the work we do that it is enshrined deeply in every campaign we run. But I note that the questioner uh, felt that this was such a crucial issue to merit its own work. It's something that we do highlight in every campaign we do. Maybe we should give it more significance in future. Uh, quick question for you, Elke. Someone asked if you could elaborate a bit on what you meant by success factors. I will explain this based on the on the examples. So, um, one of the the main issues that was mentioned was the institutional support. So, in the case of the of the Viennese database, which was contested by the producers of disinfectants, it was really the support and the commitment to provide such a tool, even if there, there, there may be discussions coming up. Similarly to the, the, the Spanish example, with the, the, the tool, because it provided information on hazardous drugs, immediately triggered a big discussion. And we had the discussion also in the, in, in the session on should there be more legislation and so on. But if the information hadn't been put out there, to, to those concerned, then there wouldn't have been this, this big discussion. Um, then the second one was keeping the systems alive, keeping them updated so that they are updated at any time and having this commitment and putting the money in, into it to keep these systems alive. Very important was the dialogue with those who are concerned. So really getting the, the, the tools out there, getting the guidance out there and, uh, and discussing it with those who are concerned. That's regarding the disinfectants where it was discussed, for example, with hospital hygienists who were very skeptical about uh, changing substances because effective substances are needed, very, very strict constraints on hygiene, but the same is with, uh, with the hospitals or the same is with welding fumes. So that, that's also a very important success factor. And continuing working with people on the ground. Um, also getting the experts involved. So the Austrian example had, for example, certified substitutes. So it was the Hygiene Association that certified that the substitutes were, were apt for and for respecting these hygiene, these very strict hygiene rules. Um, the same is the involvement in the, in the Spanish tool, but also in the welding fumes, really having the experts who provide realistic guidance mm -hmm. and uh, simple information that's usable for labor inspectors when they go out to the workplaces. So these were the, were the common points. Of course, we had a discussion also about the legal frame. So the legal frame is also important. So for example, in the database on, on hazardous drugs, uh, it was important to look at the hierarchy of control measures yeah. on dangerous substances, where you, you start with elimination, but then with the technical measures, rather than providing personal protective equipment to all nurses, you really need to put in some technical devices into the hospitals too. So the, these were some of the, of, of the success factors. And we, we had a very, very uh, intense discussion, but it shows that it's important to bring information out there to get this in, this discussion going, to get awareness out there and to get the discussion going and to improve the practices at the workplaces. Thank you, Elke. Tim, we have two questions for you. The first one is on what do you mean or can you tell us more about looking 
not seeing. And the second one is, what are your views on virtual inspection? Was this discussed in the session? Thank you very much. Um, Victor described a randomized control experiment they carried out at the university. They took over 200 people with occupational safety and health knowledge, um, split them into two groups, and uh, the f control group went into a, it was in fact a kitchen within the university in which they'd planted various uh, hazards, including fire and chemical hazards. So one of them, for example, was that they taped a little lunchbox over the smoke alarm so that in case of fire, the alarm wouldn't sound. So small hazards, and they planted all these hazards into the kitchen. They sent the control panel group in to do the inspection and see how many hazards they identified. And then the, the second group, they gave half an hour's basic visual training on a... a um, inspection technique. The technique is very simple. You basically start with the ceiling, then the floor, then each wall, then the surfaces, and you read the room from left to right. So it's a very, very simple technique. And what they found was that the control group spotted only about 30% of the hazards in the room. The other group identified approximately 50% of the hazards in the room. Now this relates back in, into the next question about risk assessment. Your hazard identification process is the first step, if you like, in your risk assessment. It doesn't matter what you, which workplace you're in. So first of all, relying on visual inspection alone in your risk assessment is um, risky, if you pardon the pun. Um, so visual inspection should be part, but not all, of your um, approach to identification of hazards. There should be checking of paperwork, uh, auditing of processes and other uh, approaches as well. But this is what I, I meant about looking but not seeing. We miss hazards. Even the, the best, most expert people will miss hazards in inspections. Um, so that's uh, what we were talking about. And virtual inspections, no, we didn't touch on that one. That would be a really interesting topic. And whether you could use it as, for example, in training um, for identification of hazards, that would again be uh, an interesting approach. I do know that in Hong Kong, for example, they in fact have a virtual simulator for working at height. And they simulate, you stand on the platform and it simulates a scaffold collapse. Mm. Um, this would be a very interesting approach in training, um, but no, we didn't get into detail on that. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Um, I have another question, and it's for whoever feels like answering, because I'm not quite sure who it's for, but it's a good one. <clears throat> it's a good one. What forms of safety communications and training are recognised as the most effective when employee teams are from different backgrounds. Well, don't all jump to answer that question. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Tim, would you like to have a go? I'll start on the first point. With any information provision and training provision, you ha it has to be understandable to all the people in the group. Yeah. And if you, for example, if you have migrant workers who may not be in strong command of um, the dominant language in the culture, then you have to be looking at other communication methods. Maybe something like NAPO, which is wordless. NAPO illustrates but doesn't tell, if you assert to mean. So you have to take an approach that is understandable to each of the workers. Maybe you're going to have to individualize that training, but you can work together to build a culture of the group um, and, and bring them together so they understand that they rely on each other in the process. Thank you, Tim. Um, another question has just come in. Would you all like a coffee? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you very much to the rapporteurs from the sessions.